Hi everyone, it's Casey Washington from Sister Girl Chronicles. Hey, it's been a long time since I've done a video. Uh, Sister Girl Chronicles is a blog that focuses on women over 50 with travel, lifestyle, and wellness. Well, today we're gonna to talk a little bit about wellness because I'm gonna tell you about a journey, a wellness journey that I'm going through right now. As you can see, the left eye is a little weird. Uh, that is because I am recovering from retina uh, detachment. Uh, I had surgery a couple of weeks ago, I think about almost three weeks ago. Uh, and this has been a, quite a journey. So I want to talk a little bit about it because, um, of course, you know, we all are getting older, so it's 50 plus, right? And this is something that we should uh, all know about. So what exactly is retinal detachment? Well, actually, it is an emergency uh, situation where a thin layer of tissue in the back of your eye, your retina, pulls away from its normal position. And the retinal detachment, what it does, it separates the retinal cells from the layer of blood vessels that provide oxygen and nourishment to your eye. And then the longer this detachment goes untreated, the greater risk of you risking um, permanent vision loss in that affected eye. So let me tell you what happened to me. I was actually on a cruise in, uh, in uh, the Galapagos in uh, Ecuador. And that last day of the cruise, I started to see signs of the detachment. However, <laughs> I was in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And um, so that next day we did leave um, the, the Galapagos uh, and Ecuador. But the day before when I noticed the signs, and of course I started doing a little research, um, I had, had my significant other text and said, I need you to make this emergency appointment for me. So as soon as I get off the plane, we head direct, directly from the airport to the ophthalmologist's office. And my self-diagnosis was correct, but it's not always good to self-diagnose, but this time uh, it was uh, correct. So let me tell you a little bit about the symptoms of uh, retinal uh, detachment. And and it's not painful. I didn't feel any pain at all, but there were some warning signs. So one warning sign is floaters. You know, we all have them. You know, you see them occasionally, but sometimes we train our brain not to see them. But floaters are these tiny specks that drift in and throughout your vision. I mean, you, you see them. If you really think about it and focus, you will see them. The other one, one more thing about symptoms is the flashes of light in one or both eyes. You might see a flash and it, it, it'll take you back for a minute and nobody else is seeing this flash or you think the lights are flashing, but that's, that's not exactly what's happening. And sometimes the flash of light is in, only in one eye, might be in that detached eye, uh, the, the eye that's going through the detachment, or it could be in both eyes. Another symptom is blurred vision. I started to have a little blurred vision, um, and then sometimes people will have a reduced side vision, your peripheral-like vision. And what the other symptom that I noticed, I had like this curtain-like veil shadow over my field of vision. It was like gray. And um, it's like, wow, what is that? At first I was thinking, what? What is going on? But yeah, so I had the curtain or what they call a veil that, that kind of goes over your field of vision when you're looking out. Uh, I did not have flashes of light and I did not have floaters, but I did have a little blurriness of, of the vision. One thing that you need to know if you're having any kind of symptoms like that, you need to immediately, immediately see your ophthalmologist, your ophthalmologist, not your optometrist, your ophthalmologist or a retinal uh, specialist. So that's a little bit about the symptoms. Next, we're going to talk about uh, the causes. So you're probably thinking, wow, that's a lot of information about retinal detachments, but some of the risk factors that you need to know about. 
Of course, we talked about aging, okay? Retinal detachment is more common in people over age 50. So if you're over age 50, like me, 61, these are some things that we need to know about, that the possibility, doesn't mean you're gonna have it, but there's the possibility as we age, we're more at risk. Uh, another uh, factor is previous retinal detachment in one eye. So it could happen again. It can happen again. I'm praying that it doesn't, but it could happen again. Family history of retinal detachment. That's another one. Extreme nearsightedness, myopia. I had extreme uh, nearsightedness nearsightedness throughout my life. So that could be another reason the doctor was telling me about that. That that could be a possibility. Previous eye surgery, such as cataract removal, LASIK. I've had LASIK. I've had cataract removal too. Uh, severe, previous severe eye injury. We talked about that um, uh, before with some of the causes. And then previous other eye diseases or disorders um, that could cause the thinning of the retina, you know, like you, sometimes you'll hear your uh, optometrist talk about lattice, lattice degeneration, something like that. So those are a few risk factors. Aging, previous retinal detachment, family history of retinal detachment, extreme nearsightedness, myopia, previous eye surgeries, previous severe eye injury, and previous other eye diseases or disorders. So those are the risk factors. Now we're going to talk about some of the treatments. Now for the causes of retinal detachment. There are basically three types of um, retinal detachment. The first one, when it's a hard one to pronounce, it's called the regmatogenous. Regmatogenous. Um, and this type of retinal uh, detachment is the most common. Regimatogenous detachments are caused by a hole or tear in the retina that allows fluid uh, to pass through and collect, collect underneath um, the retina. And then that fluid builds up and causes the retina to, to pull away from underlying tissues. And then that area where that retina detaches uh, it, they lose their, their blood supply and they stop working, causing the vision loss. This, uh, the most common cause of regimatogenous detachment is aging. Let me spell that regimatogenous. <laughs> it's R-H-E-G-M-A-T-O-G-E-N-O-U-S. Regimatogenous. Okay, whoo. That's a word, y'all. That's a word. So the most common cause of regimatogenous is, is aging. So as we age, I'm 61, as we age, the gel-like material that fills the inside of your, your eye is called vitreous. And that may change, the consistency may change, or it may shrink, uh, or it can, it can become more, more liquid. So... Uh, when there are some complications of like that, sometimes one complication is that there's a separation or, or a tear. And as this separates or it tears off the uh, or peels off the retina, it's going to tug at that retina enough to create a tear. And so if, if it's left untreated, that liquid can pass through the tear into the space behind the retina causing it to detach. And I think that's part of what happened to me, you know, especially at my age. Uh, also, there's something called tractinal, tractional, T-R-A-C-T-I-O-N-A-L. I'm going to spell these words because I'm not a medical doctor and I may be pronouncing them wrong, tractional. And this is where there's some scar tissue that grows on the retina surface and it causes the retina to pull away from the back of the eye. And usually the tractional uh, detachment is seen, typically seen in people who have poorly controlled diabetes or other conditions. And the last one, and I'm probably going to murder the name, extative, extative, <laughs> E-X, 
U D A T I V E E X U D A T I V E. And in this type of uh, detachment, the fluid accumulates beneath the retina, but there are no holes or tears in the retina. And this detachment is usually caused by age-related macular degeneration. It could be injury to the eye or tumors or inflammatory uh, disorders. I know when I told people that I had retina detachment, a lot of them thought, oh, I, thought, I only thought that came from you injuring your eye. But no, there again, there are three different types, the regimentogenous, the tractional, and the exudative three causes. Next, we're going to talk about some risk factors. So now let's talk about diagnosis and some of the treatments that are available. Once you feel that you have some symptoms of retinal dis detachment, and you know, don't take it lightly if you see some of those symptoms, you make sure you go straight to your, your uh, ophthalmologist or retina specialist. The, when you go in, there the uh, there's going to be a retinal examination, and they're going to dilate your eyes, both of them. They're going to they're going to actually uh, examine both of your eyes, probably not just the one that's affected. And you know, we all know about that bright light when they dilate our eyes. Well, that bright light is coming, y'all. It's coming. <laughs> and what they do, they use a special lens to examine the back of your eye, including the retina. And it is hard, honey, it's hard. Well, the bright light in the affected eye wasn't so bad because I couldn't really see. Uh, the, uh, this um, special lens that they use is, you know, very, it gives a very detailed look at the whole eye and the doctor can see uh, any tears, uh, any holes or detachment. They're also going to do an ultrasound uh, of your eye <clears throat> And that is to test if bleeding has occurred in the eye, uh, which can ha can make it difficult to see your retina. So it's going to be a very extensive exam. So be prepared for that. And like I said, the doctor is probably going to look at both of your eyes, even if the symptom is just in one. Uh, so just be just be prepared for for that. Now, thinking about the treatments. Now, if you have a uh, retinal tear, hole, or detachment, surgery might be the way that it is treated, especially if you have a detachment. And your ophthalmologist or retina specialist will explain to you the risk and the benefits of all the treatments. So for retinal tears, which is is still dangerous, but it's not as severe as the detachment. Your eye surgeon is probably, if you have just tears or hole and it hasn't progressed to a detachment, your uh, ophthalmologist or your retinal specialist is probably going to uh, suggest two, one or two things. Well, there are two types of surgery. There's laser, laser surgery, where the surgeon actually directs a beam, a laser beam into your eye through your pupil. The laser uh, makes burns around the retinal tear like, uh, it's like it's sealing it almost, yeah. It sounds scarier than it is, but you know, modern medicine is amazing, it's amazing. I read about some of the things they did before modern medicine when it came to detachment and I was like, ooh. <laughs> People live through that. They, they, when they live through it, they, they couldn't see crap. But you know, thank God for modern medicine. <laughs> thank God. Uh, there's also something called freezing cryopexy. Uh, they'll give you a local anesthesia to numb your eye. The surgeon applies a freezing probe to the outer surface of the eye, directly over the tear, and if and the freezing causes a scar that kind of helps secure that retina to the eye wall. So it's done on an outpatient uh, basis. Uh, after the procedure, they're gonna tell you, you know, avoid activities that might jar the eye, like running and strenuous exercise. And of course you cannot do any swimming, any scuba diving, da 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 da. Now for the retinal detachment um, treatments, whew, 
Okay, that's what I had, red attachment. So I had to have, I had to have surgery. Um, and and the key here is that you really should have the surgery within days of the diagnosis. Like we said before, the longer you let it go, the pop, more possibility uh, of increased loss of vision. So <clears throat> there are types of surgery that your doctor might recommend. Um, injecting air or gas into your eye. And this is called a pneumatic retinopexy. I'm going to spell it R-E-T-I-N-O-P-E-X-Y. R-E-T-I-N-O-P-E-X-Y. And that's when the surgeon injects a bubble of air or gas into the center part of your eye which is called the vitreous activity, vitreous, V-I-T-R-E-O-U-S. Uh, and if the bubble is positioned correctly, it actually pushes the area of the retina containing the hole or holes against the wall or eye. It helps to stop the flow of fluid into the space between, be, I'm sorry, the space behind the retina. And then the doctor may use the cryopexy to repair the retinal break, break or, or the laser. I actually had laser, but I did have a gas bubble put into my eye. And what happens eventually, the <clears throat> gas bubble will dissolve on its own. But when you first come out of surgery, immediately you have to have your head down all the time. You do get breaks in there, but you have to lay with you have to uh, lay face down, and you have when you're sitting you have to be face down. So every couple of hours, take a 15 minute break or so. But that was the hardest thing. One, I don't sleep on my stomach. Two, I had um, I did get like a massage chair. And, I, and this uh, same kind of massage thing to lay on the bed so I could lay face down. But it was very claustrophobic. Anywho, <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. You gotta do one thing they say, do everything that the doctor tells you to do. Uh, so yeah, the bubble, and it's still in there. It's gonna dissolve eventually. Like it's like halfway point now, I can see the line. It's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, the bubble thing is a whole nother video. The second type of surgery is called indenting the surface of the eye. Uh, it's called the scleral buckling. And this is where the surgeon sews or sutures a piece of silicon material to the white of your eye, which is called the sclera. Uh, and this procedure indents the wall of the eye and relieves the force caused by the vitreous tugging of the retina. And that buckle is, um, is usually permanent. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you get a buckle, I think um, if you have several tears or holes or an extensive detachment, I think that's where they create the buckle to encircle the whole eye. I, I'm not as familiar with that. that I did not have uh, that type of surgery, but you can look it up, sclera, S-C-L-E-R-A-L. And then lastly, draining and replacing the fluid in the eye. Uh, this procedure is called the vitrotonomy, ah, the spelling, V-I-T-R-E-C-T-O-M-Y. I'm not a doctor. So I cannot pronounce all of these, but I did have this procedure, V-I-T-R-E-C-T-O-M-Y, vitrectomy, that's what it is, vitrectomy. And the surgeon actually removes the vitreous, remember we talked about the vitreous, along with any tissue that is pulling on that retina. So then you get your air, gas, or silicone oil uh, injected into that space, that's that bubble we talked about to help flatten the retina. And remember that eventually the gas and the air and the liquid will absorb, absorb or dissolve. 
and that vitreous space that they, you know, removed will eventually refill with our own body fluid. Uh, if you get the silicone oil, it's probably going to be uh, surgically removed uh, after a few months. Um, here's, here's something that's very important. After surgery, your vision may take several months to improve. And my doctor told me you may need a second um, surgery. And sometimes some people never recover the lost vision. You may not lose all your vision. Some people may lose 10%, 20%. It, 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 all, uh, it all depends. So I know I have to be patient because it may take several um, months to improve. Right now, like I said, the, oil, the gas is still in there and um, the, the vision in the left eye is mostly, uh, mostly blurred, you know, just very blurred. There's no letters to be made out or anything, but I know we're gonna get through this. So uh, next, we're just gonna talk a little bit about coping and support when you have uh, a detached retina. All right, coping and support. And I, I can talk a little bit about my experience right now. So it has definitely, I'm a very independent person and I'm very active where I'm, you know, I'm walking, I'm exercising, I'm traveling, um, just doing a lot to keep myself in shape and just, you know, well. <laughs> so this has been uh, a definitely a change of uh lifestyle for now, uh, but I know that I have to do everything that the doctor is telling me to do for the best uh, possible uh, success of recovery. So what I go through right now, a lot of times, especially if I'm walking outside, inside is not as bad because I know my house, right? But um, my peripheral vision is off, especially on the left side. And I'm so used to um, trying to see what's going on around me, especially when I'm walking outside or I'm walking on trails or wherever I'm going. I can't drive right now. Uh, so people have to kind of take me around. So that's hard when you're used to getting in your car and you're just going. They say you can drive with one eye if you have 2040, depending on the state, 2040 in the good eye. I'm not, I'm just not ready yet. I have good vision in the other eye, but I'm just not ready. Uh, and um, the good eye <laughs> can get very tired from kind of taking up the slack of for both eyes. So you have to learn how to rest and stuff like that. As you know, for two weeks, no, one week, actually, thank God it was only one week, I had to lay face down, I had to sit face down. So that was, um, that was interesting. You never know how kind of claustrophobic you are until you have to do stuff. So now I have to sleep on my side, uh, not on my side or stomach, but you can't sleep on your back because you want that retina to, you know, be, pushed back into place of where it was. Um, what else? Um, of course, there's that anxiety that this detachment may occur again, um, or the anxiety about how much vision is really going to be lost and how that will affect your everyday life, your professional life, life. Period. You know, you have to adjust. I must say, I have a whole new respect. I always respected people with disabilities, but when your vision is off, um, you uh, and you realize that certain accommodations are not made in certain places or some public places. I cannot fly uh, or scuba dive or anything where there involves pressure or pressurized type activities because the gas bubble is still in the eye, and until it completely dissolves, um, there is no no flying, which, you know, I love to travel, right? <laughs> I do love to travel. But I'm going to sit myself at home and I'm going to reflect and plan out some things in life, right? Okay, I, you know, you got to adjust, you got to adjust. Um, I said no driving. Computer screens are hard. Yeah, 
they're hard. Um, so I usually have to put on like some sunglasses or something so that that blue light kind of thing is not killing me. Uh, and you know, that may get better over time. So we will see, we will see. Um, eventually, you, you know, you might have to get glasses because your vision is going to change. Um, you worry that the second eye, you want to be safe with that. And just your, your safe, your safety of your eyes, you, it becomes magnified. Um, proper light in your house. Got to make sure things are bright, especially if you're trying to read. Uh, making your home safer. I found myself sometimes when I'm walking, I may bump into a, a wall or bump into uh, the edge of a counter or something. My, like I said, my peripheral vision is a little off. Uh, my depth of perception is definitely off. Uh, <laughs> and if I go out, I usually, I almost have to put my arm in arm with someone uh, to kind of guide me a little bit, but that may get, that may get better. Don't be afraid to enlist help. Your fa family and friends, you got to ask, hey, I can't do this. Um, technology again, the transportation thing, have people, people have to kind of take you around uh, until the doctor says it's time to, uh, you can do this. And, you know, talk to others. I, I'm on a couple of Facebook groups and it's been very helpful where people who are going through the same experience. The main thing is to have faith that, you know, this healing process uh, will be okay. And, you know, just have the patience that you need to, to heal. Um, so hopefully this information has been uh, helpful. I know it's a little long, but I want it to be very specific because my readers, my audience, a lot of you, are either over 50 or approaching over 50. And this is, um, you know, like I'm a wellness check. This is something you need to know. So on that note, it's good to see you guys and let's stay well. See you soon.